Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I know you're going to be enjoying the show with all three of us sitting in some part of the world. And therefore, I want to welcome you as good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am privileged and so is Rahul Mehta, but we don't call him Rahul Mehta. You know? We call him Rahul Bhai. He's the industry's brother. Okay, so two of us are going to talk to Harsh Mariwala, chairman of uh, Marico. But today, today we're not talking to him as chairman of Marico. We're talking to him as the successful author, you know, who's the book of the year, 10,000, 12,000 copies sold. I don't know what the current count is. But we want to learn from his, uh, his journey of life, his journey of building Marico, his journey of being a successful entrepreneur, but also being a humble being and also a person who's doing a lot of philanthropic activities. So there's lots and lots to cover. I don't know how much we can cover in the next 30, 45 minutes. But I and Rahul Bhai will try our best to make it the best best of webinar, a show for you all. Over to you, Rahul. Thank you. Thank yeah, you I, I, I actually, you know, Harsh, uh, uh, I thought that that fractured font that you uh -huh. had predicted, yeah. uh, in fact, conveyed a message on uh, business families and management, uh, perhaps indirectly. But, you know, my interpretation was that uh, the general uh, experience that I have uh, sort of had is that most business families do not last more than one or two generations as a partnership, as, as a joint family yeah. uh, enterprise. And, mm -hmm. and uh, at the end of probably one or two generations, the business does get fractured, uh, yeah. using the pun on the word fractured, yeah. Uh, yeah. and they split up. So I was yeah. wondering whether your, your font also conveyed that yeah. or tried to convey that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, going from there, uh, what is your opinion? I mean, uh, uh, is, is really uh, uh, the, the split in partnership in a family business inevitable? Uh, how does one so for it? Uh, so so I think to answer your first question was the cover design yes. from from a family business continuity part. Uh, no, it was not done. In fact, first time I'm hearing it from anybody that this conveys that kind of a message, you know. So it was not designed. It was more to do with transparency and innovation and simplicity. But your second question, you know, what do business families, how do they move forward? And I wish there was one right answer. I don't think there is one right answer. A lot depends on the kind of business one is it. And a lot depends on the family members who are a part of that business. And uh, we have seen that, especially in the next generation, normally a founder and the brothers of the founders jointly start a business. And then those are the older days when the families are much larger. And then uh, the next generation joins in. Normally, the next generation coming in is far more educated, uh, different uh, level of ambition. Uh, and that's where the difference of opinion starts coming in. And in most business families, there is lack of openness. You cannot tell something to your father or your uncle. Even if you disagreed, you have to do it in a very soft manner. Uh, so there would be lack of opinion. That's how. Uh, I think the just, uh, opinions start cropping up. Your relationship as a brother is different compared to your relationship as a cousin, or that is your uncle's son or uncle's daughter. And I think that's when uh, business families, it's a, it's a point where they start questioning whether should we be together. Um, we have seen, you know, in some big families like the ID Perry, where, I mean, for generations, the business has become, has been a family managed business. They have created strong mechanisms for it to, to continue that way in terms of the entry of uh, a young person, exit of an older person who could become the chairman. So it's a very detailed kind of a uh, code they have developed on their own. But uh, I think a lot depends on the founder or the karta or the head of the family in terms of how that person integrates the family's views. And there has to be a very high degree of openness and also evaluate what are the different ambitions of different members. Can they work independently? Ideally, I mean, each one should not trample on the other's toes because that's where the difference of opinion comes in. And it's complex because, you know, we compete with each other if you're cousins, the business. So you are at the same level that the manager level or a, 
or at a responsibility level and then you are cousins and many times you're staying in the same house so this complex role relationships actually add much more uh, it becomes far more complex to resolve and uh, but i think the fundamental thing is for any business family you need to have a very high degree of trust and openness and that has to be decided by the family through uh, some sort of a code of conduct which goes into minor details because many times conflicts happen for very small reasons you know what is the car i am having versus what is the car you should have as a family member what is who should uh, get to talk to media versus who should not get prominence and you know that's where the conflicts start occurring and then if it is not open environment then they just there's a lot of bitching and backbiting and then all the professionals they don't like dual reporting so a lot depends as i said if you know for example in a in a risky uh, trading business where uh, agility is important you take certain position maybe a family manager organization is better equipped uh, compared to a larger organization um and especially if there are many many family members then it becomes far more complex also so i think the key thing is to to identify the needs of the business and then aspirations of the family members and also define certain way of working together if all that doesn't work out then there are two ways of resolving one is a management separation wherein you divide the company in if there are different businesses in a company into different uh, two three companies each family member heads that business or one family member heads that business other is a financial separation it is painful the financial separation it can take time but uh, it's very important that one deals with uh, such separation in a very mature way because if you don't do it then we've seen businesses getting destroyed because of disputes within the family and the business has gone with the disputes to continue even the business has suffered so it's very important to build some consensus and i've seen that ideally you know working with a non family member some sort of mediator who everybody in the family trust can have an important um, i think that is very important because that person is neutral and that person is trusted by everybody and um that person is doing things in the interest of the larger family so but it's it's better that sometimes if things are not working or better to separate because then you know we have seen when a lot of energies get unleashed when businesses get separated financially because partly because of insecurity because you are now on your own partly because of your own ambitions um and you're not thwarted by somebody else so i don't think one should shy away from from these conflict these are part and parcel of conflicts uh and one has to resolve them either resolve them and move forward in a in a manner which helps the business or separate it but i have always felt that if you where do the interest to the interest of the family come first or do the interest of the the business come first and i have always kept the interest of the business coming first because if the business is managed from the right uh, way in the right way by the family members everybody will benefit but if the interest is from a family point of view then you may put one elder who may be the eldest in charge of the company and may not be the most capable and that could lead to a business getting impacted negatively yeah harsh i think that's very well said what's good for the business is good for the family but so it is what's good for the business is also good for the employees so many a times you know yes. we revolve and create organizations around employees and senior people and people who have been there for years yes but, uh, but you are absolutely right Ash, in your book, there's a lot of talk about you wanting to do MBA and aspiring MBA, and for some reason, uh, not being allowed to do an MBA. And if mm-hmm. one of your friend's son comes to you at 14 and 15 and says, uh, "What should I do? What should be my educational choices?" Uh, what would be your advice to their son? <laughs> so I think a lot has changed over a period of time. You know, those days I'm talking of when I was young, 50 years back, it was different. Uh, the businesses were managed in a different way today the businesses are managed in completely different way the environment has changed so i strongly feel that education is very very critical if somebody had an opportunity depending on the strength of their individual in terms of technology or mba or chartered accountant i think that that education has to be decided based on what you like doing and what is your strength if you are good with figures then 
of course you could be a good chartered accountant if you are good with technology you can become an engineer and then go into digital technology or a whole host of new technology which are coming up but i think it's important that you you you, you learn much more and that learning never ends you know even if you have done your studies you have to go on learning and many i have seen many post graduates they think that they've done their mba and that's it they don't need to learn from others but their learning is through the all your life you know and that means you have to search for for meaning search for opportunities search for others you point because every person has a blind spot and many times you have to be humble and you have to just say that okay i don't know please teach me in so, fact oh, in fact ramcharan uh, one of his comments was that you are a very good observer and a very good learner i mean segueing from there harsh uh, in today's world also observing and learning is as good or googling and uh, getting into the internet what is a better way to learn things <laughs> then i think you have to look at all aspects of learning you can do through google also but a lot of learning comes out of in my way in my own experience has come out of my failures you know mm -hmm. when you fail something you really think much much more in terms of what could you have done better and then you internalize that learning and you try and improve the same thing what you failed in the next time and that learning is far far deeper than just hearing it from somebody or 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 listening to somebody or or reading a book or through google so i would say that you know i mean each person has a different learning way of learning i like dialogues and i like uh, discussing with others of course i like reading a lot uh, and also my own personal experience is failing but i think one has to be open to learn from various means and not necessarily from just one one direction well, why, I, think, yeah. I think just he's just given me a the title of his second book yes i also <laughs> failed <laughs> <laughs> rahul writing one book was a big task i think i'm never going to write my second book <laughs> rahul, rahul he says that there is no failure either you succeed or you learn yeah so somewhere in the book he says there's no failure so there's no right. it has to be right. learn learn and learn yeah correct uh, correct yes, yes. Uh, but harsh uh, do you did you uh, do you find uh, uh, a kind of a contradiction uh, i think somewhere in the book you have mentioned that 70% of the uh, businesses are family owned yes. and uh, i won't say most but uh, innumerable entrepreneurs very successful entrepreneurs have not really had any formal management education uh, yes. and that trend yes. is continuing now it's not that it was only in the 60s or the 70s and yet uh, whenever these very entrepreneurs including somebody like you uh, are looking at growth and expansion uh, these entrepreneurs look at mbas uh, pass outs from management education yeah. and so, so is there a kind of a contradiction in this or or do you see <laughs> this as a kind of a natural uh, process i think again an entrepreneur looks at what is required for the business you know if the entrepreneur himself or herself doesn't have those skills is better to get those skills from others you know i for example not good in technology i can't understand technology so but the business needs technology i have to get the best technology person to manage the technology function you know so i think it's needed and increasingly rahul i personally think that technology is going to play a very very important role and entrepreneurs compared to what today uh, i think education will play a very important role in in creating special new age entrepreneurs which are leveraging on technology and creating unicorns in Three, four, five years. None of us did all that. In our, it took ten, twenty, thirty years for us to create unicorns, you know. And we've seen the likes of Nike and Paytm and you know, Zomato doing in four or five years, which is amazing, absolutely, you know. So I think technology is going to play an important role, and I think some the need for entrepreneurs to to learn to study will be far higher in future compared to the past. So Harsh, when we are talking of this <laughs> in the capital market. if if the capital market was like what it is today when you actually went to the and went to sajan and and try to mm. raise money and finally went ipo uh, mm. would 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 marico be a 100 billion dollar today <laughs> i don't know i don't I don't get into that but i never imagine it could be even almost close to 10 billion now but i never imagine when you know i i never knew what i was going to achieve in life where will i land up it just happened it evolved <laughs> But but her story, how do you manage to create network? Because a lot of people think network is about how many followers you have in LinkedIn or or on Facebook. 
But I've seen you have tremendous network, whether it is entrepreneurs, whether it is industrialists, even whether professionals who have left you and gone. Uh, and these networks are such which are positive networks where people can come to you or you can go to uh, people. So is there a method in your network creation or is it <laughs> a part of Hush networking? So I, the only method is, you know, I when when I want to meet somebody, can I add value to that person, whether it's an entrepreneur or whether it is anybody else. So even a small entrepreneur would want to, I mean, if he asks, he, she, he or she asks for an audience with me, I would normally meet them for half an hour if they're facing some business issue. So larger readiness to help others is is the is the thought. And then, you know, when you have diverse interests, you know, whether it is uh, the YPO, which I'm part of, or Ascent, which I'm part of, or business friends I'm part of, or so many seminars I do, so many uh, talks I give, and that's how you, you develop networks, you know, and then the image building also helps, I must say, in, in developing those networks. So a combination of various initiatives from different angles helps you create networks. And it's not, I mean, most of the time it doesn't help me in terms of my personal business, but it, these are connections. You know, if I want to hold a seminar, like we are having an asset seminar on 26th of November, we got the best of speakers. We got speakers from Nandan Nilkani to Rishad Premji to to I am also spending one session with this Harsha of uh, Swiggy. So all these new age business, and we were able to get it very very quickly. You know, just based on some networks, maybe some image which I have created. Uh, so this is a virtual session, but it's a very interesting session. We also have one one session with the with the writers of the book Ikegai, you know, which written book on on the Japanese way of you know yeah. living happily. You know, oh, wow. Wow. they're also going. So it's a half day seminar, which. It just turned out well and a lot of it happens because of networks you created and the goodwill you have in the overall in the society. I, I, I love that statement, Hurt, which says larger willingness to help others. So this is not a ledger. In today's world, you know, people keep a ledger on network. I did that, you did this. So when I ask <laughs> you, you have to do this. But this is such a simple statement, very beautiful statement, you know, larger willingness to help others. And that time you're not having any expectations. You know, I mean, uh, uh, we were together in college and I know you since then. Uh, you were always that extremely shy, introvertish, uh, sort of, you know, merging in the background kind of personality. Uh, and no one would have imagined mm -hmm. that you would have become the Harsh Mariwala that you have today. Uh, was there some kind of a... Uh, a dramatic incident or event which sort of changed your personality or was it just a gradual evolution? Uh, how, how has this changed occurred? No, it has been a gradual evolution. There is no one like defining moment where all of a sudden I have realized that I have to change. It's, it's a constant process of learning and improving, uh, changing. Yes, you're right. Absolutely. I was shy, introvertish, quiet. To some extent, that feedback which came to me also may have urged me to improve more, learn more, interact more. So it's been evolution over a period of time, but I never thought what I would do in, in life. I never expected what, what I would achieve. So it came from just, uh, okay, let me try my best and then, you know, go on trying and whatever comes out will be well and good. Since you said the, use the word feedback, Harsh, uh... <laughs> How does one entrepreneur, especially if somebody is holding a majority in the company, uh, decide to get so many independent directors, decide to get professionals, decide to go outside, is willing to take feedbacks. And many a times the feedbacks may not be the way you would want. I mean, sometimes the feedback may be also negative. Okay. But the ability to go, <laughs> first go and get feedback and second yeah. is to face the feedback. And yeah. third is to, you know, work on the feedback and improve over it. How does that, how does one think like that, especially a professional <laughs> So in my case, it was easy because I didn't know anything when I joined the business. You know, I'm unlike Rahul who did, I think, MBA in Bajaj. And I was just not able to get into Bajaj. I was not that bright enough. <laughs> so my initial learning came from my employees, those whom I recruited. And still it comes from those who are working in the company at a lower level. So I think that's when I said that I have to learn from others, you know, and I've learned a lot from them. And again, how do you take those critique, you know, when somebody says that, you know, instead of doing this, do it this way. If I rejected that, even if I disagreed with that and rejected completely, 
and gave that signal to that person, that person will stop giving me feedback. But if I told that person that, thank you for giving me feedback, yes, you have a point, but maybe I have a different viewpoint, but you continue giving me feedback, you will again come back to me. So it's very important how critique is accepted and how it is given. And then, you know, every person I strongly feel that, you know, has blind spots and I've had multiple blind spots in various things I've done. So when you're not sure, then you go on asking the relevant people who are better in that particular area and be just humble enough to accept that, you know, not to say that you have to accept it blindly. Ultimately, you are owning that decision because somebody else has said that doesn't mean that the decision is not your, yours, you know. So you're not abdicating the decision, but you are... After hearing that viewpoint, you realize that yes, that person has the valid viewpoint and I agree with that viewpoint. So it becomes my decision finally with his help. So a lot depends on willingness to explore, willingness to overcome blind spots. But I've seen in Indian businesses, many CEOs, they think they know it all. And the moment a person thinks that he knows it all, I think that's the start of the downfall, you know. Because you will you will have blind spot. You've seen it in in groups of uh, YPO forums where you know interact with others. Others always have a different viewpoint because they're coming from a different background, um, and you you have something which you didn't realize, but that person has has realized that you overlooked this part. You know. <laughs> Like, how do you, how do you accept this uh, situation where uh, you were very strongly of an opinion uh, that you know uh, X needs to be done and your your CEO or uh, your team says no Y needs to be done and following your philosophy you sort of accept that okay you do it the way you want and then it turns out to be wrong <laughs> you turn out to be uh, uh, right. right in yeah. hindsight. It has happened, it happened in the past. So some extent you have to give a little bit of freedom, but can you de-risk it, you know? So many times that risk of taking a decision, if it is not very large financially, for example, in case of launching a new product, uh, I may say, I don't agree with you. You are stuck. Now there is no way you can find out the response to a new product through market research. You have to ultimately test it out in the marketplace. So you may say, okay, let's test it in uh, Mumbai City or let's test, test it in a chain of retail stores like DMR and see what are the response. So at least then you are sure whether, you know, whether he's right, am I right? So break that resistance by by experimenting, prototyping on a, on a smaller scale. I think that's the only way because many times there is no right answer. You know, ultimately it has to be tried in the marketplace, especially issues relating to consumer, you know, consumer is very complex. Many times the consumer themselves don't know what they wanted. Um, they have not realized what they wanted. Unless they see it, you will not know what you're offering. You know. <coughs> Ash, many a times in the book, uh, <clears throat> you have taken strong stands, uh, which I call it as a conviction of the founder. And especially when it came to Mr. Dadi Seth's call to you and the actual buyout and how you refused it. I mean, today businesses are being made to sell, okay? Whereas you held on to business to create a larger business. Okay, how do you see that conviction of today's founder? I met a founder yesterday who said, I'm creating 19 brands over the next 10 years. And he says, I'm going to sell these brands and none of them I want to keep it. So I disagree with you that businesses are there to be sold. You know, at least I have a completely different viewpoint that if you have a business which can survive from a long-term point of view, uh, the businesses should be there for perpetuity, you know, and especially in the sector we are in, FMCG, we have seen many companies which have gone on for the last 200, 300, 400 years. Uh, Procter & Gamble, Lever started as L'Oreal family enterprises, now continuing uh, without the founder that in the, in the seat and it's completely board managed. So maybe partly driven by the kind of business we are in, which are known as defensive businesses, where it continues, long-term continues higher. I I am not one who would want to sell out and, you know, be happy financially. Because what to do, finance doesn't give you happiness. You know, the need the creating something new, sustaining that, you know, adding value to others, to me is far more, I think far more happier for me to do all that rather than just cashing out and, you know, just relaxing and playing golf every day. Is that is that more of an Indian trait, Harsh? Because I'll just share with you a very small uh, story. Uh, my brother-in-law uh, had uh, a business in the U.S. and he 
came back to India and set up a chain of very successful uh, coffee shops in Bangalore. Okay. Uh, and one day he called me up and said, uh, Rahul, I have sold off uh, the uh, coffee chain stores. So I said, uh, Raj, why? What happened? Uh, I thought you were doing very well. And he burst out laughing and he said, you know, Rahul, every Indian person I have called has expressed shock. Why have I done this? I thought you were doing very well. Every American friend I called up and gave this news, uh, his reaction was, oh, wow, you must have made a lot of money. Uh -huh. So he, is, is this, uh, right. he, you know, the uh, wanting to cling on to what yeah. you have created, is that more of an Indian uh, psyche? You are right, absolutely. It is uh, much more Indian than Western, but Indian psyche is changing. With the new generation coming in, they, they want to create a new business. Many of them are serial entrepreneurs. Where they build a business, they they are more, uh, I would say, hunters rather than farmers. They don't want to continue from long term. Point. They've created a business model, sell it out, start one more business. So it all depends on the mindset of, uh, of entrepreneurs. And, some enter some very few Indian people would just want to cash out and you know be financially happy. That's the American mindset, that's for sure. Mm. But Indian mindsets are changing, and to some extent, you're right. You know, it's it's the Indian man, mindset to to be in business. How will I be perceived in the society if somebody asks me what I'm doing? You know, I can't just say I'm just relaxing and you know sitting on this much pile of money and not doing anything. Yeah, yeah, interesting. <clears throat> oh, sure. When you build a business which reaches a $2 billion, you have created it yourself. The brands are attached to you. So Hirsch is Mariko, Mariko is Hirsch, Parachute, Sapola. There's so much that gets linked to one another. And then you decide to bring in professional uh, managing directors, CEO, of course, the independent board of directors. And the business goes from $2 billion to $10 billion today. Uh, how do you actually prepare to let go? And what are the triggers of let go? In Hirsch, I'm not talking of the chairman, in Hirsch, the individual, I'm sure your parents, your family, your brothers, sisters, your wife must have said, Eric, you're no more the managing directors. So what happens now? So <laughs> talk to us about Hirsch, the personality, letting go. So I, I think two or three things. One is the basic principle is what is good for the organization comes first. So I was in this chair of managing director from 1990 married code to 2014. So I had stayed 20, almost 25 years as managing director. We have seen that in any company beyond a certain point, you need a certain change in leadership, you know, because there is one standard way of doing things. You need a different approach to building a business. So that was one. Number two, I was getting along in age and then we needed somebody else to continue the perpetuity of business in married code. So we found in Shogatha, a person who was very ambitious and who had worked with me for, I think, 12, 10, 12 years before he, he became managing director. He was ambitious, uh, capable. Uh, and then the issue was, okay, if I step down, should I, should he become the managing director or some, my son should, in, should uh, be the managing director. But these are standard uh, old ways of thinking amongst Indian families, you know. So when I took that step, of course, there was a lot of, shall I say, I had to fight a lot of internal battles within the family uh, at social levels. Uh, but I said, no, this is good for the organization. You know, it has to come first because maybe my son was not ready. Maybe my son wanted to do something on his own, which he has done now. Uh, so it's, it's something, but the principle, the main principle was that it should be good for the company from a long-term point of view. And then I, of course, I came to the board and you were also there at the board meeting that time. And I think the board also said that this is the right thing to do. So in a way, I've created some sort of, a, shall I say, discontinuity in the way hierarchy is, uh, is perceived in the Indian families in terms of continuity. But uh, I think it's, got, it's a matter of time when the business pressure will, will make you think differently and you know then saying that your children should be stepping into your own roles you know, the, may the best person manage the business and then you've seen the impact of that on on the growth in, in the market capitalization of married with the last six years Arsh, tell me why and rahul we were talking rahul by you <laughs> and you were discussing about how 
sometimes professionals are told that you know you level a, reach a level of incompetence and we were discussing do do owners also reach a level of incompetence and do they realize it and how do they realize it <laughs> i think only way you can realize is when you're open when you get feedback from others you know that time you realize okay you have many many gaps so many most of the feedback from others come through at a peer level or at a at a subordinate level you know if there is high degree of openness you will come to know your blind spots your or your deficiencies so i think the owners have to realize if they have blind spots to by listening to others you know i think that's very very important uh, well, let me ask you this question uh, harsh uh, throughout your book you have mentioned about the launch of various of your uh, brands but every time i notice that you have mentioned heavy investment in advertising in today's times uh especially in the very very competitive environment that we are be as uh, living in is it possible to build a brand without investment in advertising so uh, the two biggest entry barriers for new brands in the past were reach in terms of distribution you had to distribute the product in large number of retailers and it was a chicken and egg situation unless the product moved the retailers would not stock the product uh, unless the retailer stock the product the product would not move consumer would not be able to buy so this was a very big entry barrier and on top of that if you needed an all india distribution network you had to have a whole series of distributors your sales reps and that itself was a huge uh, cost just to maintain that infrastructure number 2 uh, one had to advertise on press and through television if you had to create launch a new brand nationally so it was expensive i mean in anything less than 20 25 crores would would mean nothing if you had to launch a new brand but things have changed with the emergence of what is known as d2c brands direct to consumer brands uh, because now you don't have to go to all the retailers the, the brands can be sold through e-commerce and uh, you can do digital marketing at a much much lower cost you can as against 20 25 crores you can launch a brand in, in the range of i don't have the exact number but 1/10th of that cost so you can actually create new brands and we've seen these d2c brands and many of them have already reached a turnover of 500 to 700 crores within a period of 4 5 years brands like mama earth and many others you know avadam t and there are so many just herbs we bought beard which we bought about 2 years back has become 100 crore brands through mainly d2c without big investments in advertising and and distribution so all of a sudden you know this is the future of uh, fmcg in terms of going in a different direction and because the entry barriers have gone down but you can only sell it through the e-commerce which today forms about 10% of the turnover of the fmcg products okay thanks thanks so it is actually the reverse of what i had thought that i had initially thought that it's uh, today you need to spend money on advertising if you really want to break through the uh, crowd you can do it still through the main means if you have to do it then of course we'll have to spend a lot of money on advertising but we can it we can but the newer brands they can do it on a yeah. on a smaller scale you know that those entry barriers are gone you spoke about uh, modern retail <laughs> what's your take on on this uh, debate as to whether modern retail will ultimately uh, crush the small kirana outlets uh, i know mr nagesh has a very clear view <laughs> i thought i'd check with you uh, what what do uh, you take i i reckon your question is in the context of india is that right yes absolutely so in india definitely i think all three will coexist there is no reason why all three will not go because in a city like bombay i mean how many large places you will have for putting in a modern retail especially in the city up to andheri or something there will be hardly hardly any supermarkets or big stores you know beyond that of course because the real estate costs and the availability is there but i think that's one one shall i say in big cities there is one negative in terms of the rental cost as well availability of large retail location i think there is if the the smaller retailers be more proactive and incorporate some of the benefits which are offered by the modern retail and e-commerce then their ability to fight them will be much much higher compared to because we have seen and i have seen now almost 
I reckon 30% of the total, say, grocery business would go away from them. 10% in the range of e-commerce, 20%, I think, Nagesh, if I'm rightly, 15, 20% through modern trade. So 30% is gone. So they are, the whole pie is gone down by by 30%. Of course, the market size will increase because of increasing urbanization, prosperity, all that's different. But uh, the overall contribution by these two have increased and that has impacted the modern, sorry, that has impacted the grocer and the smaller retailers. But they have to go on trying hard in terms of, you know, overcoming some of the negatives, the so-called negatives. Uh, can If the shop is can be made a little bit more experiential, can they take returns back? Can the relationships be better? And they have some advantage compared to compared to modern trade and uh, and also e-commerce. So I personally think that uh, there will be some more, uh, shall I say, increased market share of modern trade as well as e-commerce. But to say that all the all the grocers or the smaller shops will vanish is is just not imaginable, in my opinion. Thirty percent may become 40, 50 percent, but not anything beyond that. I don't know what Nagesh yeah. is. Harsh, in fact, I feel the other way. I think actually the traditional trade over the next 10 years will increase their share because see what they are getting now, which modern retail never got. They are getting technology almost free. Correct. And, and because of their penetration and distribution, uh, they are becoming the hub and spoke spoke model. And, yeah. and, and therefore, I feel, and if you look at the assortment, I mean, in a 700 square feet, they have an assortment, but all of them are now e-commerce enabled. And free yeah. of cost, a modern retailer yeah. spends a few million dollars to make him e-commerce enabled or digitally enabled. And yeah. the last was the banking system and the payment system. And now with the UPI and the kind of uh, NBFCs and the finance companies which have come, the guys are digitally receiving money, sending money, and also getting uh, leverage on the digital money is being done. Yeah. So yeah. I think they're in a very good shape. The only yeah. thing which probably even people like you and Maricos and others have to do is to help them with their mindset. You yeah. say, hey guys, allow your children to come in, you know, adopt modernization, adopt digitization, and the world will change. Uh, I, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of that in my work at Train, and I think uh, I'm a very positive guy on traditional uh, retailers actually becoming more modern than the modern retailers themselves. Because when they become so, they are the only ones who know their customer very well, plus know everything else. Modern retailers right. don't know their customers at all. So most existing FMCG companies will back uh, smaller retailers because of two or three benefits. Number one, uh, to some extent, uh, distributing to large number of people act as anti barriers to new competition because others may not be able to service them now. Number two, it is also uh, uh, anti barrier to, I mean, there's no private label threat to your own existing business. So uh, ask any FMCG business, is it in their interest to continue servicing to to smaller retailers, the question, the answer is emphatic yes. And I think whatever, I'm sure if you, if you collectively get all the FMCG players together, they yeah. can, and they will, in my opinion, help uh, take any initiative, take one initiative and, you know, can it cut across all the retailers and can it be funded or helped by this whole, shall I say, FMCG manufacturers association, yeah. who I think they'll be willing to, to back them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Harsh, coming to the word innovation, you have used it uh, at least twice or thrice in the last 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Uh, I know you support and back a lot of innovation. My question is more for the country. If you were given a chance to be the Minister of Innovation in the government, yeah. what are the two or three things that you will do for the country? So I see a huge opportunity for innovation in certain very critical areas where India needs a big, big leap. What one saw in the telecom was, I mean, it's basically using the mobile technology to make a big jump in terms of our penetration levels. And I think I see a same opportunity in three critical areas of India's big needs. One is healthcare, another is education, and third is agriculture where information, if you deploy it in the right way, I mean, do you need to build so many schools across all the regions? Can you improve, can you improve the agriculture is by providing the right information in terms of what to sow, you know, depending on the rainfall, the whole situation is very dynamic. So, and also the use of best seeds. So if you collectively look at innovation to tackle these three areas of healthcare, education, and agriculture, which are our top priorities, I think we, it can have a huge impact on our overall 
GDP growth rate. But has to, it has to be a very focused approach. You know, you have to have for each of them a separate kind of a uh, roadmap in terms of how do you combine different technologies, how do you create the right information infrastructure. So a combination of different things could, I, I'm sure, even diagnosis of disease and all this pandemic has definitely helped in both, definitely in education as well as in healthcare where you you may not have to go to a doctor. Now today in Kaya, we are offering skin consultation to wherever we, even if you don't have uh, a clinic there because you can do a consultation on on Zoom, you know. So, but I have a long way to go. We, I see a lot of potential in these three areas too. So, so would, you, would you support what's happening in the education system, the Baijus and the and the early learnings of the world? I I, I have not studied Baiju and all, but but I'm sure that uh, I think what they are doing virtually will have a big impact. And I'm more interested in looking at providing basic education in, in smaller towns where there is no education, uh, there's no schooling. And, you know, even if there's no school, you don't need to create all the infrastructure of or building a school, you can do everything virtually. Of course, that personal contact will be missing, but at least they will learn children. So, so Harsh, uh, before I ask Rahul for any last question, uh, you may be in your 60s, but you you think and act like in 40s. So, <laughs> is there, is there... I had 71 almost. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. I wanted you okay, to Okay, okay. Rahul and me would be the same age. Sorry, Rahul, for revealing your age also. <laughs> So, Harsh, what is, what is 2.0 for Harsh Mariwala? Is there a Harsh 2.0? Well, I think I have a lot to do in terms of whatever I have started. So, I think my journey is going to be more in terms of perpetuity as far as Mariko is concerned, improving board effectiveness, having the right talent people, then also whatever in the area of mental health, ascent, uh, my son's investment office, my role as advisory board, advisory member of some PE funds, role as, as on independent director on many boards. I think there is enough things for me to do and I'll continue searching for newer things. Um, I started a new business, as you know, after I stepped down. It got impacted because of pandemic, but I think hopefully that business will pick up now that things are coming back normal. But I think I have to do something. I can't just sit at home and do nothing, that's for sure. <laughs> Raul Bhai, there's no 2.0. I thought it should be 10.0. He's already got 8 times in that <laughs> But I think Nagesh, I just wanted to say for the retail yeah. you know, this book, yeah. I just because I am keen that uh, I mean, the whole objective of writing the book was to give something back to the society in terms of my own learnings. And uh, I have given the book as, you know, among two professors. I, initially, I thought it would be making sense to only professionals and and uh, entrepreneurs. But when I gave the book to management school, they loved it. So now we are starting a new <laughs> marketing campaign to inculcate this in uh, among students. Uh, it's uh, three case studies are uh, to be written based on this book uh, by ISP, Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, as well as SP Jain. They all have agreed. I approached three and all three of them said yes. Now I don't want to approach more because then it'll be too many. <laughs> I mean, they'll, they'll be just duplicating the same thing done by somebody else. And then I gave it to a lot of my friends, their wives. And one good thing I'm capturing from the readers is that it's very light reading. It's like story. It's not like a business book. Number two, at the end of each chapter, there is an insight given by Professor Ramcharan, whom Nagesh you know also very well. Yeah. And he has captured it a very you know, half a page, one page at the end of each chapter. And that, that has a lot of take home value. So, I have come to the conclusion that any person who buys the book and doesn't have any take-home value, I'm willing to give a refund of the, <laughs> the cost of purchasing the book. <laughs> so all I can say is it, it, I would want more and more people to read it. We also have come out with a Kindle version, you know, an audio version also now. So if you don't feel like reading, you can listen to it. But uh, please, uh, please get listen or or read and I can assure you that you'll get some something which will be relevant to you, uh, which will have a positive impact on your life. Harsh, you are addressing the retailers and we just spoke about returns and our returns are between 3 to 5% in brick and mortar, 25 uh, to 30% in e-commerce. Now you are giving 100% return guarantee. So <laughs> this, is, this is something very difficult for retailers to, to repeat e on. No, no, I, like, I like the confidence in the product. Harsh, let me put it the reverse way. You sent me a complimentary copy, but I've learned so much from it that I would like to send you the check for the payment of the 
So, so, so Raul Bhai, you buy 10 books from Harsh and give it to 10 good friends of yours. Yeah. <laughs> so you are talking about you are talking about 10 books. I have raised the uh, proposal this morning mm. uh, to my managing committee that we buy for the entire managing committee, which includes to around 100 books, 100 wow. copies. Wow. So, awesome. And that's what I'm planning to do. Uh, yeah. Let's see. But uh, uh, one last question, uh, yeah. Harsh. Uh, I had several other questions, but I think uh, Nagesh is uh, pointing out to the clock. Uh, but uh, where do you see Mariko uh, five years from now or 10 years from now? I think we'll continue our growth journey. I don't have a, I mean, one vision that will be like this, but our, I think the key thing is to ask for us to grow at a higher than the industry growth rate both in terms of top line and bottom line to be transformational and to current two transformational agendas, which we have are to make some uh, presence in the D2C brands, which are actually only sold through e-commerce and we have acquired two brands and we're also building two of our brands. So that's one. Number two, we have a big journey in foods, healthy foods, which uh, which is already on the way this year. We should be doing about 500 crores in in oats, masala oats, honey, and you know, whatever. So there is another growth area, but over a period of five years, the business should get transformed into a wider range of beauty and wellness products and with the presence in D2C and all that should get reflected in whatever, how the market looks at us. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Harsh Mariwala for you, yeah. Uh, the more and more uh, I and Rahul by questioned him, spoke to him, the more we realized that 45 minutes is too short. And especially when you have a book full of so much of small, small nuggets and so much of learning. Uh, I mean, we could go on and on and on and on, uh, but we still have Harsh with us for another, uh, maybe a few minutes, 15, 20, 30 minutes, depending on the questions that we get. And uh, let me not waste any time and get on to your question. I mean, I have the first question coming from Sanjeev Mohanty, the managing director of Levi's in India. And we're all very proud of Sanjeev because he's just been appointed as the CEO for, for America. And uh, he is now probably our export to the world of fashion uh, globally. So Sanjeev Harsh is asking this question that post pandemic, if you have to select a CEO, uh, what are the three things that you look in the CEO? So the new insights uh, in leadership, uh, which have emerged post-pandemic, uh, the newer ones are authenticity uh, because of high degree of anxiety and stress, empathy, uh, the need to be connected. And uh, I think empathy connected, connected to emotional uh, connection. But the other ones which were there, one other new insight which came in was agility, you know. Things started happening very, very fast. We saw the development of vaccines happening within a much, much shorter period of time. Uh, culture building has also again been proven to be a very effective way to operate to virtually. So I would say that these are the additional traits which have emerged out of uh, the pandemic. And uh, I think whatever other traits which were existing earlier in terms of uh, you know, being in touch with business, getting a good pulse of business, being futuristic, all that would remain. But in addition to that, these are the two, three newer realizations which have come out of uh, the pandemic in terms of what the leader should be doing. Well, Harsh, I have a follow-on question. I was just wondering, just yeah. one year before you were running a company, you were very successful and you were okay, okay, agile. After one year, you want us to be very, very agile. How, <laughs> does, the, how does the CEO metamorphose into that? So I think it's just not CEO, but the CEO and the whole team and the agility uh, is very, very crucial. You know, we've seen that, uh, you know, as I said, vaccine development used to take eight, 10 years. And I used to talk to some pharma people when the pandemic hit us, how long will it take? They were all writing off this one and a half, two years development of vaccine. And then we saw vaccines getting developed and they were also very skeptical. I will not take a vaccine because it's too dangerous, but now everybody's taken a vaccine. So I think the whole mindset has changed in terms of how, and I think that has a lot to do with collaboration, not only with your own internally, but with external people who can help you. So I think completely revisiting the model of product development or whatever long winded uh, projects, can you relook at the whole thing and make it far more condensed? And 
and one other learning was that you can't be complete perfectionist in each and everything so sometimes uh, if you go for too much excellence then it can just delay you of course in a, in a product like vaccine it is you can't take shortcuts but uh, i think the key thing is to work in a different way use of technology in condensing time cycles um, have high degree of collaboration boundlessness and i think th- that if you if you take that kind of approach then i'm sure things will things will be condensed in future because the whole world has started uh, doing that when if you don't do it then you'll you'll fall behind harsh there's a question from gentleman called ashim from mira knitting works uh, his question is that in today's world if you have to set up a distribution network uh, how would you look at it what would be the one or two thinkings that you will use to set up a distribution network Huh. <laughs> it's uh, it's going to be very difficult to set up an all year distribution network a lot will depend on what product you are marketing and that product should have traction so just by putting the product in dealer shelves is not does not mean that the product will move so the product has to have a huge degree of traction demand generation from the uh, from the consumers and to that extent the product has to be differentiated it has to be innovative it has to make sense to the consumer so the starting point of course would be to uh, identify outlets where uh, there will be high throughput you can't uh, go all out because the cost of creating national distribution network is huge and it's a chicken and egg story where you know if you if there is no demand for the product people will not you will not get distributors so you may have to prioritize the kind of outlets which uh, which may have traction and then start with in a small way in those outlets only rather than going all out unless you have a stellar product which is too much in demand then that's different thing but by and large i would say that go gradually go with high potential outlets in towns where there is good demand uh, don't go all out don't spread thin because otherwise it will be too much time consuming as well as it may be too expensive so and then as the product gets traction you start expanding gradually well there is there is a nice uh, comment <laughs> i want raul by uh, the comment says that uh, how are you always on twitter i mean uh, they are wondering that just now you said you work so hard you have 10 things raul why are you also on twitter uh, so do you really work or do you always be on twitter harsh no 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 twitter takes some some time i am not saying that take any time but uh, you know a few years back everybody was saying you are not on social media so i said okay let me try only on i am not on linkedin i am not i am just entered instagram but i am not on facebook so i said let me try with twitter and it has had a good response i mean i have had more than whatever 900 900000 followers yeah it's uh, uh it's something which uh, i enjoy doing and i spend some time on it but not too much time you, you know harsh you can be an influencer and blogger and make a lot of money by the side on this <laughs> no that was not the objective <laughs> <laughs> want him to make even more money nagesh sir are nahi yaar i'm just saying <laughs> <laughs> oh so some there, there is there is a, another interesting question which has come say uh, from a long term perspective a founder has to tell his son uh, what what are the things that the young leader should excel in you know i think this looks like an elderly gentleman who has a son in the business or coming into the business Uh, what will be your, your advice to that young generation so i am very clear that you know every person has uh, has some god given gifts uh, and many of us don't know what our god given gifts are so the first step i would say is to identify your gifts what are the strengths you possess and need not be the strength the father may have you know and then tailor make your career your whatever business whatever you want to do in life based on your strengths Uh, no point pushing children because it's a family business if the son or the daughter is not not interested or it's not uh, leveraging the strengths uh, required to uh, succeed in that business then let that person start something else let your son start something else but i think the key thing is i i strongly believe a lot in a high degree of empowerment uh, let them choose some vocation make some mistakes fail uh, learn uh if they want to join the family business most welcome to do so i'm not i'm not saying no but i'm saying that base your career based on your strengths because if you do that then 
uh, you will enjoy your uh, whatever you're doing. It will you will not have issues of work life balance because if you enjoy your work, then there's no question of work life balance. You know everything is uh, everything is good fun and you know you enjoy your journey. So I think that's my advice. Harsh, this work life balance, Sadhguru says that there's nothing called work and life. I mean, yes. work is life and life is work. I agree with him. <laughs> Uh, Harsh, there's another interesting question. Uh, it says, the way e-commerce and these funded companies are taking over brick and mortar, and maybe this gentleman must be from the health industry, must be talking about uh, how uh, Pharmacy has bought over ThyroCare and things like that. He's asking, what do you think over the next five years? So, I mean, will, will these online companies, the new age companies with so much of funds, uh, I mean, will the others survive? Uh at least I can answer on behalf of FMCG companies. I don't think FMCG companies are vulnerable. Uh, so I don't see any threat to FMCG companies which would get acquired by, by the new age companies. But uh, if there's a threat of their existing because of uh, some new technology or because they're not able to cope up with the new age companies, then... Um, then they may sell out. In case of, I think, Thyrocare, I from whatever I, I met the owner, and I think it was more to do with uh, his old age, and, you know, he just wanted to end cash. And it made sense for Farmizi to uh, to buy over Thyrocare because it was complementary to the model. So it was not arising out of a threat, but it was, I thought maybe, I at least if I know it right, they would have sold it to somebody else. So they wanted to, anyway, if they wanted to sell. So I don't think it was a question of the new age companies grabbing up some old age companies. Um, ideally, I mean, it all depends on the kind of business you are in and to what extent are you threatened by these disruptions. And if you are threatened, then there are chances of you either being acquired or uh, going bust. Well, that was a fairly straight and a, and a hard, hard eating answer, Harsh. Uh, I think a similar question, but from a different uh, aspect. Uh, looks like a manufacturer. He's asking, saying, uh, I'm a contract manufacturer. Do you think FMCG industry will continue to depend on contract manufacturing and or with the kind of funding they have, will they go on to their own? And is there an opportunity for expansion and growth for contract manufacturers? I, I strongly believe that, you know, organizations should be doing things which where they are able to add value. And in an FMCG uh, company or any FMCG company, manufacturing doesn't add too much value. Value addition happens through marketing, through distribution, through product development, through innovations. And most of the FMCG companies have gone into manufacturing because of some tax benefits, you know, in the Northeast or earlier in, in, uh, in the North, in, you know, Uttaranchal and a few other states. So ideally speaking, I would, given an option, I would not like to have a single manufacturing unit. I would like to subcontract everything because it's something where we are not able to add value. So to answer the question, yes, I think uh, the dependence on contract manufacturing will continue uh, because most of them want to concentrate more in, in the area of product development, innovations, uh, marketing and distribution. Now, whether you should expand or not, that's something which will depend on uh, the demand supply situation with whom do you have networks with, which, uh, which FMC manufacturers. So that's something which you may have to go deeper and find out whether you have uh, buyers for whatever you want to do uh, in terms of manufacturing. And in that also, there may be competition. So it's not that just because you have a capacity, you will you will uh, just sell it to one manufacturer. Manufacturer will also look at uh, who else is, can supply in terms of quality assurance, in terms of rates and things like that. Interesting. The gentleman called Mr. Tinkesh Punjabi, I think he follows you uh, probably on social media and probably knows you also. And uh, uh, his question is, uh, say that with the kind of listing that Nika has seen, uh, where do you see Kaya five to 10 years down? <laughs> I, <laughs> you are <laughs> Nagesh, you should answer that question. Kaya <laughs> business model is very different. It's a, it's a very tough business. And you know, we are, actually we have to perfect the business model. So I don't want to give any speculation as far as Kaya is concerned. Uh, we have now just appointed a new global CEO with Nagesh's help. So let's see what he does. But it's a very different business. Don't compare that with uh, Naika, Naika, and this is pulled apart. 
uh, and there the business model is in kaya is, is dif- difficult much more difficult even than marico so let's um, i don't want to give any comments or assurance saying that <laughs> what in in terms of future of kaya you know? Uh, Rahul Bhai, uh, I know you had only 45 minutes shared with me for questions. Before we close, I know it's 6 o'clock and we had planned to close. Uh, do you want to ask any question? Otherwise, you'll say, Nagesh, no time now. I have a chance to make that. <laughs> asking, asking your classmate a question in public. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think I'll keep the secrets of Sydenham College between him and me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. No, Harsh, I think Uh, it was really, really fun talking to you. I have known you for more than a decade. I learned so much from you. And I have people who are commenting, saying that you can continuously learn uh, from Harsh. And I think it's, it's a privilege that others have got uh, of listening to this. And once you put this on to the uh, regular channels, I think there'll be lots and lots of listening due to Zoom restriction. We had allowed only 100 people to register. So wishing... Uh, Harsh, you and Harsh Reality is the book, all the best. And once again, thank you to you for taking out the time and being so candid and so honest and frank in your answers to our viewers uh, and looking forward to many more such interactions. Harsh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Nagesh, and thank you, Rahul, for Thank uh, you. For I enjoyed uh, our discussions and all the best to all your trained members. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. Me. Thank you, Harsh. Harsh, yeah. thank you.